Wonderful. I'll try some Farsi. Sopechiri, Tashakun, Mersi. Thank you to Dr. Mezbahi for inviting me to come to your lovely country. I'm very honored to be here this morning. Um, we're going to talk about today not the technique which is outlined in my book on how to do fat grafting, which is a departure from our rhinoplasty courses there that we've heard so far. I'm going to talk to you about how to think and how to see the face differently. Uh, so you can make results that are really hush getting. So it's important to start seeing how the face ages. If you look at this face here, it looks like there's gravity. It looks like the face is falling downward. But I really want you to see for a moment that if you look at the brows, the brows haven't really fallen. And if you look at her left, your right, the brow has come, sorry, her right, your left, it's come down a little bit, but on, the, on her left, your right, it's gone up a little bit. In so what you're really seeing in the brow is volume depletion. In other words, loss of fat and soft tissue. So it's a different way of seeing the face in terms of aging. I'm not saying there's no gravity. I'm not saying there's no skin changes. Clearly, that's part of the aging process. But I want to focus on something that you may not have thought about before. So if you look at this reductionist idea, which is a way that I like to communicate with patients, it's a way to understand that when we're youthful, we're great, we become a raisin over time, why should we stretch, pull, and lift it into a pea? Because it doesn't look the same. We need to reinflate the face according to those principles. But do we really want to create faces that look like this? You see this, way overfilled, it looks horrible. The reason faces look bad is because there's no artistry, and you commit two sins, two problems. The first of all is either putting the whole face too big, or what you see is too big in one area. So you need to build it up in a way that looks good by building it in an artistic way. We'll talk about that as we proceed. Another thing that we can talk about is using another model, which is a glass of water. It's a way that I describe to patients this. Because people always ask, is fat grafting permanent? And it is. But it is not perfect. And we'll talk about those limitations in a moment. What we're going to talk about more specifically is that you're almost too full in youth. If you ask a woman when she thought she looked the best, she'll probably tell you maybe 30, not 20. And we'll talk more about that. So we fill to a certain height that's beautiful. And over time, you continue to lose fat. That's just the process of aging. So it doesn't make you stop aging, but it brings you back to a beautiful time. So this is really my model of understanding aging. It's a linear loss of fat from almost too full at one year, two year, 10 years, 20 years to more of an ideal. And it could be 40 for some. But whatever it is, we start to lose that volume. And so this is the concept of blink. In a blink of an eye, you look at a face and you say, wow, I can see that face being 20, 30, 40, 50, that fast. Why do you see it? Because of the facial shape. And at that 30-year junction, there's this change where it becomes oval. And that ovalization of the face is more of an ideal aesthetic in terms of the overall design. So how do we create ovals that look attractive? Well, I'm not going to want you to worry about the numbers here. So don't start writing all these numbers down. I see people doing that. I just want you to conceptualize relative scale because that's the proportionality that makes a face attractive. So if you look at this first face, she's very wide and full. So we're going to focus specifically on one part of the entire picture, which is the cheek, which oftentimes is overdone and misunderstood. So I'm only going to give you the numbers for one area so you can understand sort of my thought process. So for her to make her look thinner, I want to put more volume toward the center of the cheek and a little bit toward the outside so she doesn't look overfilled and it actually draws the face to be narrower in a more elegant way. I also did a rhinoplasty for her. In an Asian face or a half Asian face, it tends to be wider too, but a little bit of sculpting, I'm going to blend it into the buckle area, which is the center zone. So a little bit more conservative total volumes, but more elegantly brought into alignment. In a white face, a face that has a little bit more sunkenness toward the, the middle vault to make sure that cheek doesn't stand out in isolation, 
I will blend a little bit more in terms of numbers into the buckle area. These are milliliters or cc's that I'm putting into that central zone. And we're progressing forward and seeing that this lady here has more of that scalloping going down. So I want to focus as much on the outer cheek as the buccal area and really sort of look at that transitional phase where that bone comes in. Because what aging is, um, is bone exposure. It's too many transitions of the face, too many shadows, and less or fewer highlights and reflexes. So we're going to blend. Uh, on the outer aspect of that face as much as the center so you can create that arc that's beautiful. This face is very volume depleted so we need to be more aggressive in really filling that central buckle area with numbers that to me make sense so that that frontal cheek doesn't become an isolated big cheek but blends down into the lower face in an elegant fashion. And you can see here very similarly a lot of higher numbers in terms of the, the mid lower face so that that central cheek blends in and clearly even much more in that central face you can see the numbers and we progress to even more volume depletion here and again requires numbers that are commensurate or at that same level of desire even faces that are younger you think well they don't need that much volume but you see this is skeletal it's not necessarily sagging it's skeletal and you can see that if I blend that central face with some volume that's in the buckle zone, that cheek won't stand out. So this is all about blending. The analogy I really like to have you understand about proportionality is to think of a glass of water on a television screen. If I ask you how big is this glass of water with no reference points, you would say, I don't, I don't know. But if I put a shot glass next to it, the first one looks too large. If I put a pitcher of water next to it, it looks smaller. And this is the art of looking at a face. Just like when you do a rhinoplasty, if you have a, a large hump and a relatively big tip, you're not going to bring that bridge all the way down and make that tip stand out because it won't be in harmony. Same thing goes when you're designing faces. Every part of the face has to be in elegant harmony. So we talked about permanence. Well, how permanent is it? And how do we see the face? I like to use this analogy, or excuse me, this, this story of twins to have you understand it. So why don't you take a look, not just at the larger picture where she's 37 and 42, a very subtle difference. People that judge my work with their left analytical brain may see, I don't see a big difference, Doc. But if you use your right brain, which is that subtle change where you say, hey, how does that, how does that feel when you shake that person's hand? Because a lot of times as surgeons, we're so technical. We're left brain. This has to be four millimeters bigger than that one. But we don't start seeing beauty. We don't see, see the total elegance of the face. So yes, she's aged over six years, but she looks younger. Look at the small photo. The, the picture on the right, okay, is my patient, 42. The photo on the left is her identical twin sister who does not believe in any kind of neurotoxin, fillers, fat, brow lift, face lift, nothing. If you were the surgeon trying to figure out why in a blink of an eye that small photograph in the same lighting, her twin looks older, she looks older, you would say, I don't know what it is. Maybe her lips are too thin. Maybe she needs to have her brows lifted. Maybe she needs a face lift. Maybe her smile lines, nasolabial grooves are too deep. But if you look carefully, her smile lines, her lips, her smile lines are the same depth, her lips are, are uh, equally full, her brows are actually higher arched. It, the reason she looks slightly older, or maybe some people have said like a mother, is that the shadows of the chin, are, the shadow of the chin is deeper, the outer cheek is bonier, and the transition going into the central cheek is different. The, the temple and the brow highlight is absent and looks skeletal. So if you go back and look at my twin at 32, you can see that she almost looks like a twin of herself at 42, and her sister looks like a twin of her at 37. So does fat last? People say, no, it doesn't last. You know, no long-term results. It's gonna last you four months and it's gone. I would beg to differ with that. I really believe that fat has a long-term presence. My mom is seven years out. I only did a little filler touch of her with her last year, and she still looks amazing at 74. Longevity is, is there if you do it well, which we're not going to get to, you know, that's another 20, 30 minute discussion. But we're talking about why does it last long. When I was studying for my board exam, I looked at this book by Unger that said that there is 
a process of neovascularization, new tissue ingrowth and blood supply to a hair graft, right? Because when a hair graft takes blood supply over a year, it's there. Same thing occurs with a fat graft. It takes a year to mature. So a lot of times that early edema you think is the result, it's not. It actually dips down. The grafts don't take hold for nine to 12 months. So the problem I see with a lot of physicians is they have false expectations. And really, if you don't understand the limitations of fat, come to my talk tomorrow where I delineate more of how to leverage fat versus fillers. And if you can't articulate or communicate it to a patient, you're gonna have dissatisfied patients. So when that blood supply kicks in, it truly lasts. So I talk about this arc where initially you're too full. And in a month, you may almost look too good. And at three months, you may almost look too bad. But there's a slow process with fat that just matures over a year to two years and it looks better. Minus further aging, that's why you see that little bit of a dip at the end. So let's take a look at a case study. If you look at this lady in a week, doesn't look attractive, too full. Maybe just slightly too full even at a month, but looks much more youthful. And the only other thing I did for her was a neurotoxin. This is at three months, dip down, maybe presentable, maybe too low, maybe ideal. It's all an idea that there's a little bit of variance with fat. This is at six months. Maybe it's gone down more, maybe it's gone up. But over a period of 11 months to 16 months or 15 months, there's a maturation. She didn't gain weight, didn't do, do anything else control for all variables other than just doing a neuromodulator over that year and she has maintained the fat and people argue it's going to go away after 15 months. I always say does a skin graft get up and walk away after a year? Does a free graft disappear at a year? It holds. After a year the blood supply is there. So let's talk about how light influences the way we see the face. Sometimes we feel like Nick Nolte on a bad day because the lighting is always bad but understand how does light shine on the face it comes down from the top, no matter where you are. You're indoors, you're outdoors, and that's why we have to make light shine on the face better by creating the appropriate convexities, minimizing shadows and transitions, and minimizing bone exposure. So I like to look at the face like a balloon that deflates, and when we highlight those right places and the light that bounces down looks good, the same thing occurs with the face. All of that is true, so when light shines down and bounces is the key. Going back to the analogy of hair transplantation, donor dominance, what does that mean? It means hair that's moved from the back of the head to move to the front stays and retains the native genetic characteristics of the hair back. That's why when you do a transplant, you shouldn't lose the majority of those hairs that are transplanted. Well, that's the same thing with fat. Fat has great retention on the belly. I mean, look at it. If you try to lose weight, it's hard to lose it here. So it has great retention. The problem is, especially where I come from, Texas, is if you gain 20 or 30 pounds, the face can look almost too full. So when I'm choosing a patient and I'm worried about donor dominance, I have to select a patient with relatively steady uh, weight or at least someone that's on the move towards slight decline. So that's important that you understand that. Weight stability is my number one risk. When I outline for a patient what is the risk, it is weight stability. I want to conclude with one more elaborate thought. Why not use implants? I'm used to them. Tomorrow we'll talk about why not use fillers. But why not use a cheek implant? Why not use a chin implant? Do I use those? Well, I do a lot of chin implants. I don't do a lot of cheek implants. Here's the reason why. Light should replace light. If you lose soft tissue, you should consider replacing with soft tissue. If you lose bone, you should put something with bone. If you've got a small chin, don't put fat in there, put a chin implant. But why not use cheek implants? Why is that not necessarily, in my opinion, a great way? And again, if you're getting great results with male or alloplasts, I'm not here to dissuade you. I mean, this, we have, there's many ways to do this. Just because you heard one person say something, it's not gospel. This is just work, what works for me. But I'm here to influence your thinking. So if we go back to that paradigm that as we age, we start to lose volume, then let's talk about what portion of that volume is soft tissue versus hard tissue? This is my argument, that we lose very little hard tissue. Unless in the old days where you had bad dentition, bad dental caries, you may lose more volume on a CAT scan or in real life, but you don't lose that much hard tissue. You lose a disproportionate amount of soft tissue envelope. In which case, this is what you see. You see exposure of bone. You see more bone over time, not less. 
And if that's the case, let's talk about putting an implant in there. You put an implant in there, you actually expose the implant. You show more bone, which in my opinion, if it's not done well, and you do an isolated zone instead of brushing and blending the face, you look older. And it looks with more bone articulation. So let's go back to the concept of just aging. Again, you see that narrowing where you're getting more bone exposure as you get older because of a greater degree of soft tissue or fat loss. What happens when you do fat transfer or fillers? You increase that differential and so that it actually has a resemblance back to like when it was youthful and that volume is sustained and the coverage of bone and the transitions are improved and going back to that photo of Sharon Stone, you can see that that hopefully makes sense. So what we're trying to do in this diagram is with fat transfer is to minimize transition points rather than in increasing them. And I think by doing so, you change that. What Malcolm Gladwell in his book Blink talks about is how does someone look? The problem is a lot of times when women look at their face, it's 8x, 10x magnification this close and trying to read what makes them look older. Instead, think about this. When you see an attractive woman, when you see an attractive gentleman, whatever it may be, do you not, in a blink of an eye, 20 feet away, make that judgment, right? That's how I, I think you should start judging your own work for a moment. Don't go look at it with the nuances. In a blink of an eye, have you made that person more attractive? What's the goal of facial cosmetic surgery? Just to make a cheek bigger, to make a lip larger, to make a brow higher, to make a tip smaller, or to make a face more beautiful? I would argue it's the latter. But fat is not without risk. If we're talking about risk benefit. Remember, the younger you are, we don't know how you're going to change with your weight over time. If, you've, if you have a track record of a lot of weight fluctuation, you've got to be careful of that fat maturing over the next 20 to 30 years because you can gain weight. And that's what's the risk of fat because it's bioactive. It's not bioinert. I was giving a talk in 2007 in Columbia, uh, Bogota, uh, sorry, Cartagena, Colombia. I've given talks in both, and, and a gentleman said, I wish you had told me this because I use fat to reconstruct a jawline, and a 17-year-old and her jawline got bigger over five years because the person gained weight. And that's why I advocate not using fat like a filler. It's a bioactive product that should be done to blend the face architecturally, not to try to shove it into a jawline or shove it into a nose or shove it into a cheek in isolation. That's my philosophy. The implant to me is very safe in a 20 year old. They have so much padding, you put a cheek, a malar implant, they look great. A decade later, they look 10 years older than they should because that malar implant has caused more bone exposure, in my opinion. So go back to that idea of like replacing like. Um, for some of the hands on things, I don't make any money off this course, so I don't want you to think I'm promoting this. But in St. Louis, I'll, uh, I put a few brochures out there on the main table. I'll be actually hand walking you through how to do it on a cadaver. And I think what's really cool is Vaseline works tremendously well um, in a cadaver to simulate how your hands move with fat. And one other pearl is when I started doing fat, I didn't have Restylane. But now with hyaluronic acid products, maybe don't charge the patient and try to simulate when the patient's asleep, when you do a facelift, how to move a hand. Um, with fat, because it's a totally different way to do fillers nowadays, in my opinion, with cannulas and to do fat, but if you intraoperatively use a hyaluronic acid like a fat graft, you may be able to start building confidence in doing the hardest area you do, which is around the eyes, but it's very safe if you do it well. So I leave you with this thought, is as surgeons, for a moment, step away from the left brain anal analytical component and think like an artist, think about beauty. So you can make results that re really are kiri hush gele. Merci. Thank you,